good morning or good evening, depending on your location. My name is Brian Kelly. I'm the head of investor relations here at Market X Ventures. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to our bi-weekly webinar series. For those of you new to Market X, we are a tech-enabled investment manager and end-to-end -end fintech platform that provides our clients with a streamlined way to gain access to evaluate and exit opportunities in early growth and late stage private technology companies. The firm was founded by Catherine Chen in 2015 with a broader mission to address growing liquidity needs and access inequity within the venture asset class. We've worked with more than 300 family offices, high net worth individuals and institutions over the last seven years and currently manage upwards of 125 million in AUM. Today, our research team will be discussing three deals, a secondary opportunity in Remac, which is an EV hypercar technology infrastructure play and two primary opportunities, the first in Carbine, a secure and interactive SaaS-based communications platform for 911 and other mission-critical contact centers. And lastly, ZoomCar, an India-based self-drive focused car rental company that allows individuals to rent cars by the hour, day, or week with a model similar to that of GetAround and Turo here in the US. If you have an interest in any of these three deals, others displayed on our website, or like additional information on our pre-IPO investment platform as a whole, please contact us at business at themarketx.com. I'll now turn it over to Mike, Wassam, and Catherine. Thank you for the intro, Brian. Um, and it's really nice to see everyone on the webinar. My name is Mike Bai, and I'm the head of investments here at MarketX. Um, we pride ourselves to look for and seek opportunity everywhere in the world with technology companies of varying stages. Um, and we really pride ourselves to, to give these opportunities to our clients and partners from all over the world as well. So the first company we're going to be discussing today is Remac. It's a Croatian-based uh, electric vehicle company founded by Matt Remac in 2009 when he was 21 years old. He initially set out to event the world's fastest electric vehicle company and sports car. And he started by doing that in 1984 with a 1984 BMW M3 series where he retrofitted with an electric propulsion system. He won tons of rewards for that and was able to start selling uh, the components of that company into other automakers over the years. I wanted to share a brief uh, presentation and then open it up to, for Q&A um, where the presentation will be about 10 minutes and the Q&A will be about five to 10 minutes depending on questions. So Remac is a global tier one supplier for EV batteries and EV powertrains for the largest OEMs in the world, including Porsche, Aston Martin, BMW, and others. As I mentioned, Matt Remac is what we believe is a visionary founder, and he's definitely been an underdog for all of his life, but somehow created the ability to really create innovation in the EV space. As many of you know, the EV space right now is, is increasing um, exponentially with respect to adoption going forward. I think yesterday it was announced that in Europe that they will outlaw in, uh, internal combustion engines by 2035, forcing all automakers to be electric. So Matt Remac aims to be the highest powered, most performance driven sports car based on EV technology. The company is located in Croatia. Croatia is a new member of the EU, has an extremely highly qualified workforce that is at, actually at a relatively low cost. Remac has about 1,300 employees, 15% of them in R&D in Zagreb, the, the capital of Croatia. And the company is now seen as a leader in the country in terms of one of the largest employers and is attracting the best talent from all the former Balkan countries, including Slovenia and Serbia. The company has about $800 million or 800 million euros of funding from both financials and strategics. 
His most recent funding round was left by SoftBank, as well as Goldman Sachs Group for 500 million euros Series D round at a 2.2 value a billion post-money valuation. The company also has Porsche Ventures and Hyundai Motor Group and Kia Motors as also large investors that came in at previous rounds and also participated in the most recent ones. It is a collection of really, really strong, both industrially minded, but also financially minded um, investors that are really helping the company grow uh, into the future. So in terms of this, opportunity, we have 6.25 million euros of common shares in the company at a valuation at 18% premium to the previous round. The company has two main lines of businesses, Remac Bugatti, which is the automotive side, and Remac Technology, which is supplying components as a tier one supplier to all the large automakers. For Remac Bugatti, the company has started to sell as, as well as deliver the Nevera, which is currently considered the fastest accelerating EV car, car in the world. It can go to zero to 60 in 1.8 seconds, has about 1900 horsepower. It's designed with advanced carbon composites and fully customized to every buyer. They cost about 2 million euros each with a goal of producing 150 total units per year and will be profitable uh, in 2023. The company also just bought Bugatti, the Italian uh, sports car brand that Porsche ended up selling to Remac because Porsche was transitioning all of its cars to from gas to electric and thought that Remac would be perfectly positioned to help transform Bugatti into electric vehicle platform. Bugatti currently has about 90 million euros of revenue per year and is also profitable. The car here that the company produces is considered a bellwether for its technology. It is a demonstration for its technology that it has designed itself. The second main product line is Remax technology. And this is currently representing about 80% of the company's revenue. And in the long run, it represents about 95% of the company's revenue. The main innovations that Remac created are the battery packs, the integration of the battery packs into the car, and e-axles. And the company has also developed complementary components in terms of software to help manage all of these things together. For the battery pack itself, it is currently has the highest amount of energy density in the world. They call it power energy density. And that's a measurement of the amount of battery pack energy per unit of weight. The question for the battery pack right now is how to maintain peak power for best acceleration and performance. And this power energy density really suits the bill for Remac and its customers. The second question for its design is at high speeds, how do you maintain control and also brake responsibly? This is where the E-axle comes in. It is attached to every single wheel and has an all torque vectoring system where it enables electric stability and traction control for every wheel and also innovations of braking. Combine this with the software as well as other components and you have the basically ability to accelerate as well as maintain control and torque as well as brake while you're going at incredible speeds. So these two products the battery pack and the e-axle are the two most competitive products within the Remac uh, product line. And the company is currently working from 20 announced to maybe 40 unannounced OEMs and brands as a tier one supplier for future projects. Some of the ones that have been announced, including Porsche, Lamborghini, Austin Martin, Audi, et cetera. So the company is really going after the hypercar and supercar markets for these products. As a result, the company has about $300 million in revenue or in 2021 and has an excess of 26 billion euros in revenue in the current pipeline of projects that have been linked with various automakers in the world. These are just some of the, the announced customer base. As in competitive analysis, they're really focused 
unpack manufacturing at lower volumes. So that's for the battery components and they compete with integrators uh, as well as pack manufacturers in, in different parts of the market. Most of it you see uh, in terms of the LGs, the, the cattles um, are really focused on high volume and cell manufacturing. They're producing the individual cells. Remac partners with them to create the packs themselves that have the specific um, uh, performance profiles. With respect to the e-axles, Remac is focusing on the e-axle system while managing costs as well as performance. Many of the companies in that they're competing with are large tier one conglomerates that either focus on single subcomponents or are designing for maximized cost efficiency and less performance. So Remac is really trying to focus on both sides of the coin, creating a very high value-based solution for their customers. There's a lot of news also related to how the design and manufacture of the battery components um, have been going. And there's a lot of news in the media related to the efficiency of the pack's total mass and energy density. So Remac is really focused on a huge market in automotive battery technology that's expected to grow to about 150 billion by 2023. And it operates within the premium hypercar as well as supercar segments. These are relatively lower volume, but much higher value um, where the, the companies that are buying the components are a little bit less sensitive in price than you otherwise would have. A quick uh, a tidbit about working with automakers. Having looked at the autonomous vehicle companies and, and understanding how they work with automakers, you kind of see the dynamics at work where it takes new cars about three to seven years development cycle to be created. So a car being created right now uh, would take three to seven years to get on the market. An uh, interesting note, Tesla, is, has a much uh, faster development cycle, which helps this innovation and, and the speed to market. Automakers typically hate risk. They're really conservative with new suppliers, which means that Remax ability to work with so many automakers is a big vote of confidence. Range anxiety is a big concern for electric vehicles. So you see recently that automakers have been putting more batteries physically into the car to reduce the idea of range anxiety. Typical goal is about 300 miles per charge, similar that to, to what you would see in a normal car that's using internal combustion engine. However, more batteries equals heavier cars. And in a sports car or a performance vehicle, the performance becomes lacking due to the weight. So that means less acceleration, less control, et cetera. So therefore, for the same amount of weight, these performance-related vehicles need higher performing components to deliver that sports car experience. And that's really where Remac comes in. In terms of going forward, the company is projecting that many of its revenue will be hitting in 2025. And this is because again, it takes years for production to ramp up for a new car. Some risks related to this include projects in the automakers that are delayed, potentially canceled or have limited success. And this happens with every single car out there. However, Remac is managing this operational risk by diversifying the amount of automakers they're working with and also preparing themselves for higher volume manufacturing going forward. In 2025, they're really projecting that the initial sales and high production of both this battery as well as e-axle will start taking place. And then the company will consistently grow at a 40% CAGR until 2030. So based upon different base case scenarios, we believe that this is a two to six times multiple on, on invested capital. So just to summarize, the company is founded by Mate Remac, who's a visionary founder that started when he was 19 years old, grinding away into uh, the current size of the company. And the company now has about 1300 employees with about 50% of them in R&D projects. The company has about 26 billion in pipeline for tier one supplier contracts with large automakers all over the world. They project to have an average 40% CAGR 
beginning 2022 into the 2030s. For it's gotten a, a lot of uh, vote of, of help and vote of confidence from the largest automakers in the world, having multiple investments from Porsche and Hyundai, as well as Camel Group, which, which is an investment holding company of automakers. And the company is hiring a lot of seasoned executives for increasing in volume for their tier one supply and contracts. So for those who are extremely interested in uh, fax cars, electric vehicles, and our, our climate, uh, we believe this could be a very interesting opportunity as an investment. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions um, from the audience. So please feel free to hit the Q&A button or just uh, type your questions directly in chat. Hey, Mike, I got a, a real quick question. Is there any insight into the, the margin profile uh, between just the, I guess, the Bugatti line or the EV hypercar line compared to the components? And I know you mentioned that the revenue split is, is going to be more 95% to the kind of technology infrastructure and components play. Anything from a gross margin standpoint or operating margin standpoint you might be able to elaborate upon? Yeah, absolutely. So right now... Again, there's there's two sides of the business. So Bugatti as well as the Nivera, the Bugatti is already profitable. So it's meeting, you know, relatively low margins as with all, all automakers, but because of the cost of the car, as well as um, the intricacy of the car, they're still being profitable um, and positive cash flow on that. For for the Nivera, the, the new sports car, the company is currently losing money because it's still ramping up production. Um, however, in the next year or so, it, it believes to be profitable on that as well. The margins are relatively low, it's, uh, but it's because they're a high-end sports car, they're still relatively higher compared to um, other automakers in the industry. But what you have to understand that the margins of, of the, these two um, sports cars are, are not the goal, right? They're, they're proving ground for technology. And as I mentioned, um, automakers who are OEMs, the Porsches of the world, the you know the Lamborghinis of the world, they don't want to use su supplies and components from untested vendors. So what Remac is really doing is testing a technology on its own cars, showing that it works, showing that it works well, that it can perform, and then say, hey, this go can go directly into the car of the Lamborghini, for example, or Ferrari. And that's really what the what the deal. Um, what the goal for, for their cars are. So with respect to um, the, the, the technology side of the house, of course, software um, has a little bit more value than hardware, but hardware is still operating at, I would say a 10, 15% EBITDA type of, type of position. And it's really a quantity play, right? So um, at lower volumes, of course, the EBITDA margin will be higher but at higher volumes, uh, it's really a volume play with relatively limited EBITDA, as well as a competitive advantage to be in the car for that your design inside um, for the foreseeable future. And the goal is to really be in as many cars as possible um, at the, at the you know, specific production volumes as high as possible. Any other questions? If not, we're gonna send it over to Assam to talk about the next company in, uh, in our group today with some thanks mike um so on top of remark uh we would like to introduce you to a very interesting deal that came from israel so that's uh carbine uh technology disrupting and innovating in the 911 emergency space so as you may know in the united states we have a lot of legacy technologies and carbine is actually addressing one of these where we feel they have a, probably the most sophisticated technology. The need they address is basically related to the emergency response infrastructure that is, as I was saying, facing key challenges, including understaffing and really a lack of technological innovation from, from the past. So, you know, we live in a society where applications like technology companies have had a strategy to give her data. And as a result, they have more knowledge today about the customers and information like the, their precise locations, their preferences, and they have that 
when some 911 emergency response units don't really have uh, this sort of information and you got their citizens in some occasions stuck in situations that could actually result in, in life or death and those emergency response units cannot really attend them in the best way. So we're seeing here Carbine actually serving those citizens around the world with uh, a, a life-changing solution. So basically the reason why Carbine is relevant uh, to us uh, is because the current tools used by the 911 emergency response units today to actually address those critical situations are really built upon legacy systems that were developed 50 years ago. So really, when you think about what that means, it really do mean for that response times today vary anywhere between three minutes and up to 15 minutes. So that's a terrible time. So that's when you actually think about the life of people and and, and, and those situations that could result in life of death, to us, Carbine is, is really a quite appealing uh, a product. All around the world, and especially in the US, you have a massive, massive ambition from governments to actually improve those emergency responses to better serve the needs of the, their citizens. And as a result, with this push from governments, uh, we believe the public safety market is expected to, to reach about 20 billion by 2025, growing by uh, approximately 30% yearly. So with that, there's a massive opportunity for players like Carbine. And that means from a product perspective or from a technology perspective that Carbine has developed a cloud-based next generation 911 software platform solution that actually enables the emergency response teams they partner with to actually connect with the caller through text, voice, video, and, and actually arm them with critical data like precise location tracking. So when you think about it, it's an end-to-end, -end, a full end-to-end -end integrated emergency solution for the entirety of the emergency management workflow. So imagine you're driving on a scooter, your scooter gets into an accident and you're not able to grab the phone, call 911, wait on the phone until someone actually picks up the phone. Here, you literally just have a button on your scooter that literally calls for emergency and directly, instantly, the emergency has direct access to, to your location. And even you could see footage of where you are, see what's the situation if, if you're on the floor, and actually take steps to directly call the adequate emergency response unit. So this is what Carbine is actually doing, integrating with partners like Apple, Google, and even some scooter companies to, to actually integrate with their solution. So, so far Carbine's technology platform has served about 400 million people globally. Uh, that's kind of massive so far. They currently process about 400,000 calls per day. So in terms of milestone achieved, it's a lot, but we feel it's really still early in their journey. Uh, when you think about the global population, uh, uh, you could actually scale to, to even more countries, even more uh, uh, reach even more citizens globally. So if you look at the, the, the current achievements or, or milestone reached, uh, they have contracts with 71 customers. And those customers include the Miami-Dade Police Department, the US Global Medical Response, uh, also in Mexico. And they're also running pilots, pilot programs uh, with the NYPD, the Chicago Police Department, Denver, San Antonio, and a lot of other larger police bodies in the US. And when you think about those contracts uh, with, with these customers, they're usually three years and more, up to, to seven years with the early contracts we got. And those customers really stick to Carbine. That's something we found really uh, astonishing here. It's... Uh, and that's because they, they're really changing the, the infrastructure that relies uh, uh, sometimes on old Motorola systems uh, at these police departments. The value they do bring ultimately to the citizens gets directly recognized as it really can drive governments to, to, to demonstrate that they're doing some good to, to the population, uh, improving some, some really uh, death rate metrics. So we really expect this to, to, to continue as the company scales its innovation. Uh, keep on reinvesting in, in research, development with new partners, uh, improve the connectivity to, to more and more players in, in, in building a, a full ecosystem that can address more, more people. 
and makes basically people's lives safer. So in addition to what I just uh, defined as uh, their core business to government uh, business, technology use case also does include ride sharing safety. So just think about a partnership that just established with uh, Didi in Mexico, where the, 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 the ride sharing company is, uh, is integrating the, their solution. You also have use cases, which are, I would say, quite obvious uh, in, in terms of the need from insurance uh, businesses. So for example, you, you, you can now instantly give her post-accident information to help at reduce fraud. And that solution is used by AIG and Avalon so far in the US. So, so it's not really just helping governments, uh, not only helping the individuals, it also helps the whole ecosystem, as I was saying. It uh, does also somehow contribute to employee safety and people's safety in, 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 in countries like Mexico, India, and Brazil, where the level of uh, danger and risk is more important, I would say, with a level of emergency as well that is uh, slightly less developed than in the US in some occasions. So we are actually seeing these applications to be relevant in more than just the countries where they're tackling these, these issues. Uh, you can think of growth opportunities way beyond those initial markets. So you can have a global rollout of the solution at some point in the future that could actually bring much more value to them, but also to the investors uh, that are backing them. On top of that, the unique unit economics sorry, of Carbine are very, very attractive in our opinion. So far, uh, we've been quite impressed by their three to four years technological advantage versus the competition uh, as they continue to develop a cloud-based contact center with uh, real-time uh, mission-critical capabilities. And I would say that's really what differentiates them from the existing legacy infrastructure, uh, but also the competitors. Uh, we're seeing tremendous growth in the revenues of the company. Uh, they're on track to double uh, in revenues versus the last year, and eventually a uh, uh, more quadruple to, towards next year uh, and reach about um, 120 million in, in, in revenue by 2024. So when you look at the, the margin profile of, of this software solution, we are in the top tier with approximately 90% margins. So that's quite astounding, uh, we feel. And when you look at it, I mean, it's, it's on track to become cash flow positive and, and profitable very rapidly. Uh, and despite their reinvestment rate in the technology. So that makes it a, an even more interesting opportunity as we have the possibility to invest up to 10 million uh, in their Series C financing round at uh, quite an attractive valuation uh, with, uh, with an 8x uh, this year revenue. Uh, I think the multiple speaks for itself um, and that takes the valuation to, to about 200 million pre-money. On top of this, we would be investing alongside with some quality investors, such as Hanako Ventures, the Founders Fund, and eventually uh, Valor Equity and, and the former uh, US director of the CIA, the general David Petrius, uh, who's actually a, a, an early believer in the technology. To sum up the investment opportunity uh, for you, we believe the Carbon is one of our best opportunities today, as it's uh, uniquely positioned to scale in a market trip for Disruption with almost no competition and a strong technology. They reached a scale where they're ready to accelerate their, their customer onboarding as they are now attractive to even larger police departments. On top of this, the time to invest and scale really is now, we feel, uh, as there is a massive uh, government spending happening in, in, in the US to actually improve emergency infrastructure. On top of this, the company was started in Israel with a management team that does include experienced Israeli entrepreneurs. Being based out there, they, they get to have a relatively lower cost and more, more efficient structure. So that's, that's what we feel is a plus. And on top of this, uh, usually Israeli entrepreneurs are, are usually a good bet, uh, especially in the sector. And ultimately, I think the valuation is... Again, as I said, very attractive at the current level, especially considering Carbine has a sustainable technological advantage that is a winning long-term contracts and, and on top of a market that has high barriers of entry due to the complexity of the uh, infrastructure they are disrupting. So that's, that's about it for, for Carbine. I don't know if I, if I have any question. 
Uh, otherwise, we happy to move on to the next company, Zoomcar. Do you have um, any comparables like the size of success of current competitors? Like how saturated is this emergency response service industry? I'd actually never even heard of it before. Like any comparative multiples that are available or perhaps like some interesting precedent transactions just so I can get a better understanding of the space. Thanks, Wassam. Sure, thanks for, for, for your question. So first of all, I think the, the competitive let's get is quite poor so far when it comes to that, to that space, nobody has really addressed this, at least in the U S to the, to the scale they, they, they did but really what we have today is an old infrastructure. And again, we, we happy to, to, to touch on this one-to-one and, and, and really dig in a bit more, but from our understanding, it's really just them tackling that, that, that problem here with, with this type of solution. Would you like to jump on the next uh, company, Catherine? Thanks everyone for attending again. The last opportunity today we have is Zoomcar. Um, Zoomcar is the equivalent of Getaround or Toro in India. Um, if you haven't heard about these companies, Zoomcar basically helps um, you know drivers who do not own a car to rent either an hourly basis or you know intraday uh, for you know quick pickup of the car to actually sharing of cars so p2p marketplace uh, it works with individuals you also work with corporates to help um, basically ride hailing for example some drivers might uh, borrow the car and basically conduct uber like services in India. Uh, it solves the problems of congestion, affordability, and air quality at scale. Today, Zoom Car serves people in 50 cities, more than four countries, uh, has 34 million downloads, 6.7 million booking, and over 2.6 million users. They're on track to reach 220 million GBV target for fiscal year 2023. Based on our research, Zoom Car has a 90% market share in um, India, and today with the rapid adoption uh, and strong user engagement, we have seen it's quickly, you know, adopting in these countries so around 20% months over months. Why is this business flourishing in emerging markets such as India? First of all, we know that low vehicle ownership is a huge. Uh, problem and that today, you know, a lot of middle class that are having increasing income, they're looking for affordable way to travel. And in this case, right, there's a high upfront cost, buying a vehicle is very expensive. Second, there's an underdeveloped leasing financing market, which limits the number of options to acquire new used cars. Secondarily, we see there's poor infrastructure in and high congestion which leads to intermittent driving. So if you've ever been to Indonesia, if you've ever been to India, clearly this has been a problem. Most people travel through mobiles or rickshaws. Uh, the younger population definitely are embracing this model and they look to find ways to travel cheaply and also that uh, actually helps with environmental problems. High urban density always is also another factor to create a marketplace model, higher adoption of people who wanted to lend their car and also borrow the car. Last, um, because there are limited regulatory burdens for new mobility apps, this is actually helping with the flourishing of these businesses. So today we can see the increase in millennial population, improved 4G, 5G connectivity, and also growth in domestic tourism, also helping countries such as India and Pakistan. Uh, overall, we see a 90 billion annual global TAM opportunity by 2025 with the success stories such as Get Around and Twirl. You can see that these companies have had very good success raising money and also practicing and helping increasing the adoption of uh, borrowing and lending cards through a marketplace. So in terms of the segmentation, we can see that most people travel for either out of city or work related travel, right? For your day to day. And India accounts about 40% of that global market opportunity. Improving the infrastructure creates significant opportunity for longer road uh, bookings. So for folks that wanted to travel on the weekends, take a day off uh, intraday, this is a great option because there's no such thing as, um, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody has tried to uh, use, um, you know, the typical uh, rental car uh, companies. There's 
actually very few companies that operate in India today for the sector. Next, uh, we look at car sharing and marketplace as a very efficient model um, because number one, supply source for um, retail professional entrepreneurs quite low. And today there's a 100% P2P marketplace across all geography. Zoom car sharing platform basically allows the host to list the cars on marketplace when idle and choose the dates to share. And then lastly matches the booking with listed cars and sharing earnings with the host. It's about 60, 40% revenue share amongst the host and Zoom car, which is a huge margin business. Um, as many of us know, um, when we you know look to list, list our cars on a platform, there requires a huge software component and also uh, AI deep learning to help the process and making this process as efficient as possible. So looking at a customer profile and use case, you can see um, you know drivers are relatively young from 18 to 35, 25 to 40 year olds old. Um, this is an increasing trend amongst folks that uh, who are entrepreneurs and also people who um, have huge demand uh, traveling in and out of the city. Last, uh, it is a mix of cars such as sedan, compact SUV, etc. Um, today, this is still a very small you know, market compared to where it should be, uh, given that you know, India today doesn't have a very high car ownership. Remember, it's around 10% only. So Zoom Cars Prepare technology uh, enables the experience for customer that's unrivaled. So from mobile to IoT to microservices, um, you know, as retails can easily uh, find real-time scheduling for hosts, as companies, they actually uh, white label sometimes for OEMs and leasing companies. Um, this allows the corporates to easily accommodate their employees as well. So as I mentioned, uh, the software component of this business, data science creates a differentiated experience and focused on continuous improvement. So from an AI ML point of view, um, the real-time driver scoring, the predictive analytics behind the maintenance alerts, and also the dynamic pricing, um, as you have used Uber and Lyft, probably understand the pricing kept changing depends on the customer base and also the vehicle inventory matching system. Um, we really believe that the other competitors in the market does not have these kind of um, software components, also AML, which allows the company to really provide a first class experience. Computer vision wise, they've also focused on, you know, helping uh, detect vehicle damages, um, customer fraud, and also, you know, when it comes to KYC, the client's ID matching or verification. So let's talk about who are the competitors. Um, we also see Rev, um, Miles, My Choice, Movebee, and also Drive as the other competitors. In terms of coverage, Zoomcar clearly has the mark, is the market leader um, with over 50 cities covered was a relatively asset light model and also it's a SaaS platform. So there are multiple ways to use in Zoom car. You can uh, book it for hours. You can also enter into a subscription. Zoom car has improved this process by allowing zero penalty for ending a subscription. And also um, it has opened up more flexible subscription model for enterprises. This requires a high technology, um, you know, barrier to entry, significant capital investment upfront, which means um, a big portion of the investment will be used to acquire more cars and more fleets. Also, we uh, see a very robust operational network with experienced leadership. So where we see this is, um, as you can see, Greg Moram uh, started the company. He's the co-founder and CEO. Um, Give Dubash is a CFO. Um, as you can see, his experience at Sunrun, Bird, Citibank, and Plenty, which has a lot of Silicon Valley um, experience tied to the understanding of the financial aspect of this business, which is huge. And um, the VP of engineering um, also came from Grab, which has huge uh, experience when it comes to right hailing and the retail business. Lastly, we have Yuri Levine, from um, Ways Move It Infosys. He is uh, chairman of the board and also independent director since 2020. 
Um, also, you have Hiroshi Nishijima from Grab, BCG, Honda, uh, Shurem also is the chief growth officer who used to work at Airbnb and Apple. Dipankar Tawari, um, who is a senior advisor, worked at Tata, which is one of the largest conglomerates in India and Uber. You know, I'm sure this does not uh, require uh, explanation with investors such as Sequoia, Ford, our crowd Mahindra, Horizon Ventures, which is Li Kaxing, our Hong Kong billionaire's uh, ba backing. Uh, this company has been really growing at rapid pace, and we believe that from a financial point of view, this is also a very good opportunity given post-COVID, you know, there will be a resurgence of ride sharing, ride hailing, and therefore increasing demand for, you know, this borrowing and host lending business. Today, we can see there's 20,000 registered vehicles, on the P2P marketplace growing at 20% MOM. The overall GV, GBV and revenue will recover um, by mid 2022, and companies are already uh, to are on track to achieve 23 million revenue with our round, over 80 million by the end of 2023. Lastly, you know the targeting break-even India booking that attrition will hopefully achieved by September 2022, uh, rising to 46 by Q1 2023. We believe that in the next three to five years, this company will be able to have an exit. So to break it down, the financial performance, you can see here due to the COVID shutdown, um, 2020, 21 has been a really tough years for ride hailing business across the board, especially when it comes to this platform sharing model. But starting from this year, you can see significant uh, resurgence. And also we believe that revenue will achieve uh, hopefully profitability by 2023. When it comes to EBITDA evolution, um, you know, sure, we can see here initially there's a, a requirement of upfront investment to acquire the fleets. And then by, as I mentioned, 2023, Q3, Q4, we should be able to look at a positive EBITDA. Lastly, net attribute contribution per booking trends um, is very strong in India. So we see that the margins have actually significantly increased over the years from a high ticket size combined with consistent frequency per guest. This is also very good data for us to see the gross profit and CAC uh, relationship here. So overall, the steady state of gross profit has been rising since Q2 2021. And we believe, uh, again, it will be um, around the 20-30% rate for the next few months and quarters. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. We believe that due to the large market TAM and also the rising demand and recovery post COVID, this company is in a position to grow steadily and also to create more demand. The company has formed more partnerships with OEMs around the region and also looking to expand to other countries. With that, we'd like to leave the time for any questions you may have regarding Zoom car. Okay, well, uh, I definitely wanted to thank everyone for um, your participation today. And if you do have any questions regarding any of the companies we covered today, Remac, Carbine, and uh, Zoom car, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I, I believe we have sent out another email reminding everyone who have changed our webinar time to 9 a.m. and also 2 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully that will cover uh, more folks around different regions, different time zones. So please feel free to reach out to us. I'm Catherine, along with Mike, uh, Brian, and with some. Thanks everyone for participating and have a great week ahead.